afternoon. Um, we are delighted today to welcome our colleague Tamir. My name is Leila Shukrun. I'm Professor of International Law, Director of the Democratic Citizenship Team at the University of Portsmouth. And as I said, very happy today to welcome Tamir. Tamir happens to be my former student. Um, we met a few years ago at Maastricht University in the Netherlands. And since that time, I'm really delighted to see the, well, the journeys of Tamir really, because he's made a major, you know, progresses somehow and already uh, achieved a, a number of things, including the publication of very interesting book, Sri Lanka, human, <clears throat> sorry, Sri Lanka Human Rights and the United Nations Scrutiny into the International Human Human rights engagement with the third world states, which was published uh, last year and already met a large audience, I think. So I, you know, warmly recommend that you uh, have access to this book, Sri Lanka Human Rights and the UN, which was based on Tamil's uh, PhD. Uh, Tamil is now working on a series of other publications, including on the topic he's going to address today, so which basically deals with the decolonization and also deracialization of international law. Tamil is now a lecturer in international law at uh, Griffiths College in Dublin, Ireland. So without further ado, Tamil, I'd like to give you the floor for about 20 to 30 minutes. And then we'll have questions and answers. Everyone, you know that you can use the chat box below screen here. Yeah. 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 Thank you very, very much, um, Leila. Um, I mean, it's it's my profound privilege that Leila um, invited me to um, um, to give this uh, talk. Um, and also thanks to Olga, the University of Portsmouth, for um, organizing this and giving me this platform. Um, I mean, this is certainly, as uh, many have uh, said in different settings, uh, a new way to encounter and, and to discuss academic issues um, in light of the pandemic. And I'm um, sincerely uh, grateful that so many um, people have joined here. And I see some of my students are also online and, and colleagues and, um, and so on. So my warm welcome to everybody uh, wherever you are um, um, you know, tuning in from. So, um, as Leila has introduced already, um, uh, I have written my, my first book on uh, Sri Lanka's human rights engagement with the United Nations uh, from a uh, twile perspective, if you wish, um, and giving it a twile spin. And um, my next book, um, from which also part of this presentation will um, flow from, deals uh, with a very contemporary topic, namely uh, the title is at least Taming, Taming the Beast, um, Counter-Hegemonic Approaches to uh, Combat Racism, Xenophobia, Authoritarianism uh, on a Global Scale. Um, it's, it will be very much a twile-linked uh, book. Um, and from this book, um, there is a chapter that deals with um, racialized capitalism um, and how colonialism has contributed to the making of um, racialized capitalism. So uh, from the title of the presentation, um, let me you know, uh, introduce you and, and walk you through the three uh, larger sections. Um, namely, number one, the standard of civilization, number two, racialized capitalism, and then number three, the consequences that we are still facing um, under international law from the colonial aspects that have contributed to a racialized capitalism. Um, and as Leila also said earlier, uh, if you have any questions, please you know, write in the, in the chat box and um, hopefully we, 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 we can work through them after I finish the presentation. Um, and also my apologies that I don't have any fancy um, presentation. Um, I was not thinking really about it um, these days. To do a presentation so if you wish i can you know uh, build up a presentation and then um send it on to leila um, and university of Boston for later on and it can be sent sent around later on so if i may refer to Emile cesar um from his very famous book discourse on colonialism uh, cesar reveals that the colonizer's sense of superiority the mission as the world civilizers depends on turning the other into a barbarian. Colonization um, the, the, is the deliberate destruction of the past 
the so-called thingification, as he calls it. Um, Cedric Robinson understood fascism not as any aberration from uh, the march of progress, but he uh, rather says it's a logical development of the Western civilization. Um, he says actually in a particular term, he says fascism is the blood relative of slavery and imperialism. Uh, and coming back to Aimé César, um, the, uh, he, spoke, he spoke about that nobody colonizes innocently. Um, and a nation which colonizes, a civilization which justifies colonization, he says, is already, is already morally diseased. So to this end, uh, colonialist Europe has uh, graft and modern abuse onto ancient injustice. The hateful racism was um, put into place onto uh, old inequality. Um, the Swiss literary uh, critic um, Staravinsky uh, held um, all that is uh, not civilization, all that resists or threatens civilizations is monstrous, it's evil. The defense of civilization can in certain circumstances justify the recourse to violence. The standard of civilization to this end is a tool of hierarchy. Um, it separates um, those admitted to um, the international society of states from those deemed unworthy and denied entry, at least until they can measure up. So, um, only one or two days ago, I gave um, a webinar which was uh, focusing on trans civilizational dialogue. Um, it was organized by the Kathmandu School of Law in Nepal, which was a very interesting discussion where we discussed the, the, the aspects of what the measures of civilizations are, what the standards of civilizations are, and how um, eventually uh, through the, the progress of the Westphalian idea of civilization, which was then stipulated um, in the non-Western world. So sovereignty as a concept, as prof the great Professor Angie had also um, mentioned as one of the most proponent um, figures of uh, the Twyl, the third world approaches to international law movement. He said that Twyl, uh, sorry, uh, that sovereignty was a Western concept that was then extended to uh, the non-Western world. And through the idea of sovereignty, we saw the uh, emergence of civilization up to the standards that were uh, created by the Western world. Having said this now, um, giving this kind of a um, you know, background, um, I would like to progress now to the second stage, um, namely the, the aspect of racialized capitalism. Um, David Fiedler writes, international law used to impose policies, institutions, and values embedded in Western civilization. Western powers then advanced their civilization by using a system of capitulations and imperialism. And it is in, in this aspect, in this against this background that we need to um, uh, um, look at uh, the the ideologies and and um, intellectual uh, amplifications that were stipulated by Francesco de Vittoria. Uh, he uses the idea of use against him, justified the just war as it was linked to commerce trade. Um, business cannot be barred. Um, it's interesting that Vittoria, however, always spoke about the Indians as ones that had reason, who had their own civilization, and that they needed to be treated equally. Um, and this is this background of this whole discussion that also Anthony Angi has picked up on. And interestingly, it was Leila who introduced me to Anthony Angi while I was studying under her in, in uh, Maastricht. Koskinemi says, the legacy of the Salamanca school was to develop a particular imperial and modern conception of dominium. The modern concept uh, of dominium, euskensium, and just war uh, led to the emergence of um, centralized states, global economic states based upon private property, continental warfare. It led to the creation of empire, 
And it is in this context that we need to stress that interestingly, early international law by Francesco de Vittoria in particular, um, used the egalitarian discourse to justify possession. And that is come something quite interesting to consider in this uh, larger picture of the creation of empire. So capital can only be capital when it is accumulating upon the dispossession of the non-Western world. It can only produce and move through relations of severe inequality among human groups. So in this vein, the emergence of capitalism progressed over the following centuries as the mercantile principle of the profit-making uh, penetrated deeper and deeper into the realm of human and ecological life. Chris Maniapara wrote a great book in this regard. I, I'm not sure if you came across this uh, wonderful book, currently writing a book review uh, for, the, um, for uh, the Northern Journal for uh, um, Human Rights. Um, it's, it's a book that I would highly recommend to every, anyone who is here in the room, uh, Colonialism in a Global Perspective by Chris Maniapara. Um, Chris Maniapara writes, um, colonizers attempted to commodify, extract, and appropriate land, labor surplus from differentiated racialized groups. And then he furthers to say, different forms of colonial coercion, racial differentiation, were employed to cheapen the price of labor, to dehumanize labor and the laborers. So the current, in this regard, the current state finance racial violence nexus nuances the inseparable confluence of political economic governance with racial violence, which enables ongoing accumulation through dispossession by calling forth the specter of race. And the specter of race is a threat to the legitimate state counter violence in the interest of financial asset uh, of ongoing classes. Um, in this regard, also a, a shameless plug, I wrote um, uh, a short piece on critical legal thinking, which is um, a website by um, critical legal scholars from the University of Warwick, one, one um, cherished colleague is here also uh, as a participant. Um, so I wrote this uh, piece um, against the background of uh, the ongoing um, uh, police violence in the United States, but in particular as a triggering point, the killing of George Floyd. I named this article, um, the system was never broken, it was built this way. And in this article, I, I, I tried to explain and elaborate how um, the early forms of slavery uh, and people who worked on the fields uh, were policed by uh, slave hunters uh, and slave owners used those slave hunters to track down slaves that, that tried to flee and keep them as part of the commodity on um, the slave plantations. And this form, I mean, in a nutshell, has then metamorphosed and contemporary forms of uh, policing uh, of marginalized groups in particular of uh, African Americans in the United States. So police violence that we know today as, as a part of a part and parcel of the United States history is a direct result of settler colonialism. Uh, there is no other way to explain this. So um, if we, if we fall further um, and, and broaden the picture of, of violence that we see and colonialism and racialized capitalism uh, that emerged through colonialism, uh, we, we just have to um, share our view uh, to France. Um, think of uh, the, the, um, the banlieues in 2007, the marginalized groups that, that were excluded from the state making. Um, think of uh, the different ways um, how uh, racialized capitalism through colonialism had uh, prospered and emerged in um, the non-Western world. If we look at the current remnants um, 
of colonialism in those uh, parts of the world. And I'm thinking in particular of Puerto Rico. Um, I'm thinking in particular of uh, Sri Lanka. I'm thinking of Chagos Islands, uh, which was one of the most important cases in terms of um, the colonial discourse of last year uh, before the ICJ and its advisory opinion. Um, we see the impact of racialized capitalism uh, also on uh, various health systems of the world. And we see that also in different forms of um, housing projects around the world. Racial capitalism did not arise after this um, new form of colonialism. Um, colonialism began uh, with uh, as its animating spirit. Racialization is to this end infrastructural um, to racialization, uh, to, sorry, uh, to uh, colonialism. Um, with legacies from slavery that persist into our own time. Uh, when, and once I had mentioned to you earlier uh, Puerto Rico or Chagos Islands or um, Sri Lanka, um, I, I came across yesterday um, parts unknown um, by the, the um, unfortunately too early deceased Anthony Bourdain. Um, and it's not only a cook show um, that I'm watching on Netflix, it's rather Anthony Bourdain um, investigates um, political, historical, colonial um, um, backgrounds of, um, of uh, uh, um, the, the colonial heritage, right? Sorry? Yes, I have a question. Sorry? Is this a question or? Sorry, somebody just unmuted the microphone, but I, I uh, muted them again. Oh, okay, right. Sorry. Sorry. Um, so, um, the, I mean, the, uh, to come back quickly to the point, um, Anthony Bourdain uh, unpacks um, in, in a very interesting manner the colonial uh, background and the existence of colonialism until current times and the impact of colonialism through racialized capitalism in current times when he discusses the issues of African slaves that, the, the, that were brought to Puerto Rico or who were brought to, um, to, to Brazil, or um, even if I look at um, the, the country of um, my, my parents, um, namely Sri Lanka, we still have excluded African communities that are a distinct community uh, in Sri Lanka, for example. So those visible um, uh, representation of colonialism um, is there in front of our eyes and their exclusion from the making of a society uh, is part and parcel of racialized capitalism. But I will come to that in a, in a bit and also discuss it perhaps in, in, a, um, in the larger discussion. So coming back to Chris Maniapa and Maniapra, um, the new colonialism is emergent then through racial capitalism and is manifested through, he used it for examples, namely capitalist war, number two, racialized rule, number three, moral deception, and number four, transformative resistance. Racial slavery um, is uh, uh, stipulated through the total commodification of human beings, where human beings were treated as units of currency. And this is what I said earlier, when we see uh, the existence of slaves as the ultimate product of racialized capitalism through colonialism in those different parts of the world. Um, co colonialism in its multiple and asymmetric of, uh, forms does not just entail an attack on different people's social encounter and lands, but a war on people's families, cultures, spirits, and um, psyches. Neocolonialism, uh, rooted in the rise of racial capitalism, redraws the line between humans and non-humans. And colonialism is a form of the social power and the social differentiation that structures societies on a global scale today. So, 
Um, I think I'm, you know, meeting the 20, 30 minutes in a bit. Um, perhaps uh, let me um, conclude um, with um, a quote by um, U.S. scholar Ruth Wilson Gilmore, uh, and she said, um, interestingly, and, and in, a, in a, an elaborate and sophisticated way, the following: um, All capitalism is racial from its beginning which is to say that the capitalism we have is inherited and is constantly reproducing itself and will continue to, de to depend on racial practice and racial hierarchy, no matter what. So it is with this that I would like perhaps to, to conclude. Um, the way how colonialism um, transgressed into the non-Western world was through um, the first contact of commerce. But then it progressed into uh, a system of exploitation, plunder, pillage, and uh, subjugation through um, an elaborate form of explaining the standards of civilization that were um, created to other. At the end of the day, standard of civilization is a, is a system of othering, or a system of capitulation, a system that wants to subjugate. And through this, we saw an emergence of um, racialized colonialism that benefited the many, um, the, the few, but not the many. And the approach of uh, the third world approaches to international law to this end, uh, and I, I'm humbled uh, to be member of, of uh, this um, distinguished movement is to deconstruct the colonial legacies um, of international law and the reproduction of colonialism through uh, international law itself, but also through international organizations. Professor Angie picks up on the World Bank, uh, the International Monetary Fund, that also restructure and reorder and reother. Um, the forms of capitalism. Um, and we need to encounter this because if we want international law to be truly international, to be truly what we call Jus Gentium, Völkerrecht, uh, as we say in German, law of the peoples, then we must make the law serving the law of the people. And the counter hegemonic approach means to build the law from the below uh, in a way that serves. Um, the people and not a uh, powerful few that benefit from the remnants of colonialism. Um, and with this, I hope I have finished as a good German um, and uh, I'm you know, throwing the, back, uh, the ball back to uh, Leila. Thank you so much, Sam. Mean, indeed, you are German to some extent, right? Because you've just finished on yes. 20 minutes. Very good. Thank you so much. That was fascinating. Really very interesting. You know, um, of course, we all have discussed these questions before colonialism and international, but there is something which is relatively new and we have to investigate further. And this is precisely what you propose to do and we're going to do today. And, and certainly in your new publications, you're going to do that. You know, this ro sort of racial nexus in capitalism, again, it's it's been discussed. It's not completely new, but it's interesting to revisit it today. And also to understand that it's in between countries, but it's also sometime within a given country. A, yeah. few, a few weeks ago, we had uh, welcome Professor Anthony Box from Brown University, and we were talking about, you know, the Black Lives Matters and what's um, uh, racism today. And uh, uh, we addressed a similar question. He uh, insisted in particular on the concept of plantation and how it played a role in the US, but in many other territories, actually. And we came to the conclusion that, in fact, the, the, the real question we wanted to address is that of humanity, being human or not, is probably one of, of the, the most important question. So um, I can see that we have a number of questions for you, uh, Tammy, already, which is always a great sign. I also see that we have very distinguished audience, really. We have a number of uh, eminent specialists, including Professor Engi, if I'm not uh, mistaken, so, which is really great. Oh. So if you want to take the floor at one point, you know, colleagues, just let me know. I'm going to read the questions to Tamil first, then we have a discussion. If someone wants to say something, of course, the floor will be open. 
All right. So the first question comes from Mushin, if I'm not mistaken again. What are some of the ways international lawyers can engage with the Black Lives Matter movement? What are the ways how international lawyers can engage? Oh, it, well, it's a very practical question. Um, well, international lawyers, I believe, um, should, I mean, first of all, um, I personally engage um, with um, uh, US American uh, lawyers who are representing, for example, uh, people uh, from the Black Lives Matter movement who were um, imprisoned. Um, it's also about, um, and this is the great thing now with the trial movement and um, um, uh, the, the, the trial movement is seizing the opportunity to claim positions, powerful positions within the United Nations. Uh, so think of uh, Professor Balakrishna Rajagopal, who's a special rapporteur on, you, on, on um, the, the right to housing. Um, think of Professor Okafor, who is uh, the independent expert um, on solidarity. And then finally, uh, Professor Tendai uh, Achuimi, who is a special rapporteur on uh, racism um, under the Human Rights Council. Um, so these particular positions are also allowing us to uh, amplify and um, you know, stress the causes from uh, the, the, the international law from the below. Uh, I think that's the, the famous title of Professor Balakrishnan Rajagopal's book, uh, to build international law from the below. And I believe international lawyers can engage in a way that they um, are not only uh, rooting international law from the, from the below to the top, uh, but also in particular, they um, should engage with, um, you know, uh, actors uh, in the higher ranks of the United Nations, like these special rapporteurs, to amplify the causes of the Black Lives, Letter move, uh, Black Lives Matter movement. But moreover, I would also say it's, it's all about the, the way how we engage with the Black Lives Matter movement um, on the ground, that we offer our support with our international ex expertise um, to the lawyers who represent uh, members of the Black Lives Matter movement. But we also try to amplify the cause of the BLM uh, movement uh, through our own scholarship. We need to mainstream BLM. And I mean, I, I did my very, very um, humble uh, way to engage in it uh, by um, showca showcasing the issue of um, uh, how police violence um, has fostered um racialized violence so it's, it's also about mainstreaming you know pulling it into um the mainstream through our academic scholarship but also engaging with the people on the ground um mm -hmm. uh, but moreover as i said you know engage with the international organizations engage with you know uh, in, important actors that we keep this matter on the forefront of uh, addressing injustice mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, that's fantastic. If I, if I may, I'd like to add up something. Uh, I think many of us here as uh, law professors or lecturers or students, we also have to make sure that what we teach is decolonized, you know, that we engage yeah. with international in your teaching, in our teaching in a way which it makes sure that we present all sort of perspectives, so, so, something extremely important. Also, a number of movements are going on at the moment in specialized, specialized field of international, for instance, I'm working a lot on international arbitration and I see that a number of arbitrators are trying to uh, write some charters some guidelines for you know people from not only you know black African descent but also multiple uh, origin are better integrated into the profession so it can be also very concrete many more questions here a question yeah. from um, Aditya no wait let me find a question because we've received quite a lot um, yeah. Aditya, how should the understanding of colonialism work in the post-colonial world? For example, India and China only understand it in the sense of blue water colonialism, and they are on the same page on this. Yeah, um, it's a good question um, by Aditya. Um, I mean, we, we, we saw a reproduction of colonialism um, through um, powerful countries in the global south, um, unfortunately, and uh, I think Leila and you and I we discussed this also on a you know uh, while I was working on my new book, how China it's not only blue water colonialism it's also about the the aspects of land grabbing um, how also that it, it extends and expands to the new versions 
of um, uh, colonialism. Um, it's it's a complicated question, Aditya. Um, I I would I would say that um, it is also about an engagement with uh, post-colonial states such as India um, to um, address um, these uh, remnants of um, the reproduction, or rather not the remnants, but the reproduction of colonialism in new and different ways. Um, if I if I may use the example of uh, Sri Lanka. Uh, in Sri Lanka, we see um, the reproduction of colonialism uh, and 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 a certain extent also racialized capitalism um, as China is uh, encroaching upon um, land in Sri Lanka, but it also about uh, internal uh, internal colonialism that is uh, unfolding in Sri Lanka of the Sinhalese against uh, Tamils in in many respects. So. Um, obviously, there are different and new forms of colonialism uh, in post-coloniality, um, and uh, I, I believe the, the one of the, the ways how we can uh, address this is to um, discuss something in forms of region regionalized approaches of transitional justice um, of, on colonialism, where we discuss um, uh, transitional justice. Uh, of colonialism to to um, um, Leila just mentioned it earlier um, to decolonize um, in in uh, the, in, our, in our histories uh, our own um, backgrounds of colonialism um, and it's certainly difficult with India and China I, I I don't have a one size fits all solution definitely not uh, how we can you know encounter that forms of domination of India and China uh, in, in, in these regards, and we see this also reproducing the WTO in, in, uh, in different other ways. I don't have a one-size-fits-all solution, but it's, I think, an engagement um, at Bandung 2.0, rather, where we need to engage as third world countries, as Global South, again, in a discussion where um, we are creating a form of international solidarity uh, that we understand our common past as oppressed peoples should usher in uh, a form of uh, international uh, engagement to decolonize um, our our past. Uh, I'm not sure if it answers your question. Uh, it is a very complicated question you asked, uh, because I don't have a one size fits all solution to that. Mm. Yeah. It is certainly complex, and uh, we have even more questions which relate, obviously, to that, Samuel. So the next question is from Ramani from South Asian University. Thanks for coming, Ramani. As a tweller, how would you wish to chart Twell's reaction to the way nations have managed their COVID response? I'm trying to draw your attention to how nations have unleashed new forms of slavery as part of their response of economic hardship as well. Well, um, I'm getting the hard hitting ones today, huh? Uh, <laughs> well, I don't know why Ramani has asked this question, but I'm not going to say why. Yeah, Ramani, thank you so much for, for that question as well. Um, so the, the, the question is how, how um, third world countries or how Twail can uh, chart um, a response um, in face of, uh, you know, um, slavery or new forms of slavery in face of COVID-19, right? That's, yeah. Um, it's a very complicated question. I think, um, you know, my my um, appreciation that Professor Angie is here. Um, uh, I mean, Professor Angie and others had one of the first webinars in face of COVID-19 organized by NUS Sing Singapore uh, in March or so. And um, one of the um, questions also dealt with, you know, how, you know, third world countries you know, at a larger extent, should respond to COVID-19. Um, and, and the problem is COVID-19 has um, exposed the, the, um, the, 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 the ways how um, difficult third world countries are dealing or having a big difficulty in dealing with um, this pandemic uh, due to underfunding of their own health systems, A, and B, um, it is also exposing the painful manners how um, the caste system in India or in Sri Lanka, for example, is 
um, you know, highlighting the, the, the vulnerability of people who were already marginalized pre-COVID-19 and also reproducing all forms of servitude and, and, uh, um, and um, subjugation of people in those post-colonial countries. Um, I think Twile, um, again, you know, I, I remember, I think Ramani was there in the room uh, at the South Asian University back in February um, when uh, Prabhash Ranjan asked me a question. He asked me, uh, Twile is not critical enough of their own third world elite, uh, which is untrue, I believe. I believe we are we are critical enough. Um, Muthu Kumar Swami, Professor Muthu Kumar Swami Sonaraja had um, uh, extensively written on this. Um, and we need to contribute also the ill-founded responses of the third world countries to a lack of funding and support of the health system that should be uh, broader built uh, in forms of uh, encountering any forms of um, health crises. Um, and the response of uh, Twile should be um, in this regard to uh, draw the attention of uh, third world leaders to um, in, invest in a more rigorous way in the public health infrastructure uh, to support peoples um, who were already vulnerable. And um, as I said to you earlier, racialized capitalism has contributed in ways how um, police is affected, how public order is affected, how housing is affected, but also how health is affected. Um, I think one of the countries that has better dealt with COVID-19 is Sri Lanka, um, as a matter of fact. But that also comes along with um, post-colonial remnants of uh, public security, public security that um, goes back to uh, forms of colonial rule and how colonial rule has, um, you know, metamorphosed in forms of, um, um, of, of control has helped post-colonial countries like Sri Lanka to impose a health system. Um, but having said that, I think their Twile needs to chart a way of discussion with third world leaders that, um, that uh, overcomes um, the reproduction of slavery um, in, in the third world countries. And we've seen you know, Ramani uh, is in New Delhi. She, she knows herself um, how many people had to migrate from the north to the south, south because they had no more jobs. Um, and COVID-19 has propounded that problem. Surely, Tamila, and maybe to play the devil's advocate or to go one step further, uh, I think third world countries have to also uh, honestly revisit, look at their own practices, which are not necessarily post-colonial, but which are embedded in their society for centuries. And you mentioned the problem of caste. I mean, yeah. how couldn't we talk about that, right? Yeah. So I think, honestly, we also have to look at that. Yeah, yeah. Um, now, I mean, Twil, Twil, sorry for the and Twile needs a more stronger voice towards uh, also the caste system. Yeah. Yes. Thanks a lot, Damia. A new question from Olga. From the point of view of capitalism, is it in is it in the interest of the selected few who hold the wealth and the power to end racial inequality? Surely the concept of capitalism requires some people to have more and some to have less. Is it ever possible to reconcile this with the idea of racial gender and other equality? Yeah. So very good question, Olga. Um, when I when I was when I was much much younger, okay, that means like you know I don't want to say how, how much how much not, years, not ago. years ago actually. Uh, so uh, when I was when I was when I went to school in Germany, um, there was this um, schoolmate, you know, classmate that I had. He said something um, along the lines of, uh, he he was a staunch capitalist, and he said um, the sentence that um, capitalism requires poverty. And uh, we, we, it requires inequality. Without it, we cannot su succeed and, and, and thrive. And, and, and he said that in a very frank and open manner many, many years ago. And it opened my eyes to new forms of looking at capitalism as it, as it stood. And this was, you know, you know countless years ago. Um, I think the response 
um, does not come from capitalism to uh, address inequalities. I think that is the question that you that that it was right. I think the response does not come a lot along the lines of capitalism. The the powerful few uh, are um, living off and and thriving upon social inequalities and misery and poverty, and any response that comes um, is not based in uh, capitalism. And I think also Aimé César, uh, in in his groundbreaking um, discourse of uh, uh, on colonialism, says uh, those non-Western states were not only and Thai capitalists, they were anti-capitalists. So they, they were thriving civilizations which didn't um, uh, depend on capitalism at all, he, he discusses in this, in this book. Uh, what I want to say with that is uh, there needs to be a manifold response that is rooted in uh, accumulating um, the wealth and the splendor of traditions, cultures, uh, and narratives of the global south, the subaltern voices that need to be encountering in a counter-hegemonic fashion um, capitalism that that needs inequality, that needs racial differentiation. Um, there is another book. In, I mean, I, I still see some people are online. Um, if you're interested, there is another very good book. It is written by Gargi Bhattacharya, uh, and it's called Rethinking Racial Capitalism. And probably that, you know, with one sentence, perhaps it could probably answer um, the, 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 you know, uh, uh, question there of Olga. Um, she, uh, she says, racial capitalism operates both through the exercise of coercive power and through the mobilization of desire. People are not only forced to participate in economic arrangements that cast them to the social margins, they also rush to be included in this way and to become edge subjects of capitalism. So, you know, as long as we are edge subjects of capitalism, as long as we are pushed to the margins, there won't be a meaningful dialogue within capitalism because it is depending upon uh, the powerful few. And COVID-19 has painfully re revealed how the powerful few, you know, uh, the epitome um, is, for example, uh, Jeff Bezos uh, had accumulated wealth while us people are relying on unemployment payments because they are not able to survive in the capitalist way it is structured. Thank you so much, Samir. Well, a thought-provoking common question from uh, Professor Angie. Thanks, yeah. Samir, powerful presentation. Since racial exploitation was extremely manifested in the form of slavery, it is not peculiar to capitalism. Slavery has, long, has a long history. What can we learn from those earlier conjunction of race and economy? Um, well, what can we la learn from um, race and economy? Well, um, economy um, should be um, simple. Pro I mean, to this very complicated question, as usual, from Professor Angie. Um, you know, perhaps a very simple uh, answer from my side. Um, economy should not be rooted and based in race at all. Um, it is rather to, to, to um, you know, reconfigure how we have first our, our relationship to slavery um, and the reproduction of slavery. I mean, Ramani made this very good point there with slavery. I mean, slavery it has not ended. I mean, it, it is abolished on paper, but racism has, uh, sorry, slavery um, has metamorphosed and reproduced itself through new fashion. Um, uh, if you, I mean, speaking of Germany, for example, there was a recent resurgence of um, of COVID-19 cases uh, in Germany uh, because Bulgarian and Romanian uh, um, meat plantation workers were kept under very deplorable conditions in Germany. Um, but we have, you know, uh, put it in a new way to um, describe how people are working these days. But these people are working for a very low uh, income. Uh, people are uh, reduced in their nationality and their ethnicity to work in, in these conditions. And Germany is, and, you know, the, the, the Romanian Bulgarian uh, plantation workers are just only one example of the many. 
Um, if you think of, you know, the status of Brazilian, black Brazilians, for example, who are uh, largely, you know, still um, alienated from uh, the, the social economy um, in, uh, in Brazil, or if you look in, in uh, as I said earlier, in Sri Lanka, the African community that is still marginalized, it just reproduces slavery in a new way. And it shows that race still matters in the larger set of economy. And our, to answer the question of Professor Angie, our way how we engage with uh, the, the past uh, in terms of slavery is crucial, how we reconfigure our uh, attitude uh, towards economy and race, which is still lacking. It is still lacking. I mean, the, the, the examples of um, people who are working in meat plantations in Germany, even, uh, the ways how people are exploited in Bangladesh uh, as, as garment factory workers. Um, if we look at um, the African Americans who are still marginalized in the US, uh, it all plays together that slavery has ended on paper but it has to only metamorphose in new ways of uh, uh, colonial, new, new colonial domination. Uh, and um, this way of a critical reflection upon slavery, new forms of slavery, should pave the way that race and economy should be divorced, uh, where economy should be rooted in uh, a way that um, it is uh, without race. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, again, thanks so much, Tammy. Really interesting. Uh, I invite everyone to reread Marx, I suppose, no? Or subjugation, money, power, you know? Um, a, a, another question, which is uh, extremely interesting as well, from Richard. Let me find the question, because we have lots of comments and questions which are great, including some references to publication. I saw that Aditya had. Um, sent us a reference to a publication on caste in 12. So question from Richard. So is it your thesis that international law is not inevitably capitalist and then racialist and then colonialist, et cetera, but that it could be reconstituted on a non-anti-capitalist extra line through the UN and or from below? Well, I think it's a lot in the same question. I'm yeah. thinking, uh, of uh, Pashukani's idea that law is a capitalist bourgeois development and concerns about whether the master's tool will ever demolish the master houses. Yeah, very good. I mean, Pashukani is a very, it's, it's a very good point. I use Pashukani in this, in this piece on critical legal thinking um, as well. Um, I mean, I mean, that's, I think, the, the very starting point of I mean, uh, third world approaches international law that we do believe that, you know, uh, uh, international law is, is um, you know, has its roots in, in colonialism. It is, it is uh, racialized. Um, and also cu current uh, um, trial scholars like uh, Professor Gatti or uh, Professor uh, uh, Makao Mutua have tried to link critical race theory with trial um, in order to deconstruct, dismantle the colonial, racialized, and capitalist origins of international law. Um, the response to dismantle um, international, international law as it stands today, um, with its new forms of inflicting capitalism uh, through austerity measures, such as um, the IMF. Um, think of the measures that the IMF has inflicted uh, and the, the, the strong position that IMF holds um, without any doubt uh, in contemporary international law and the role it has inflicted upon um, you know, uh, um, situations uh, such as Puerto Rico, uh, Argentina, Greece, or in other, in other parts of the world, is just only reproducing um, the, the colonial origins. So to answer the question, I believe that um, if we want a genuine uh, approach to dismantle um, the, the colonial origins, we need to reconfigure it through the international organizations itself. Um, there is no other way. Uh, it, it is still existing, it is still existing, it is re reproducing, and it's re-emerging the empire. I mean, the empire has not ended, it, has, it, it is just only existing in new fashionable ways. 
And the IMF is one of its most powerful uh, representations of such. Um, I mean, the fact that Professor Angie, as a matter of fact, has, has, has uh, stressed it at, at some point um, in, in a talk that I mentioned earlier, that the IMF in uh, just only considers, according to its, its uh, founding statutes, that it only considers the uh, recommendations and the resolutions of the UN Security Council. And the UN Security Council is already considered to be the most powerful organization within the international system. But above that is the IMF. And the IMF, through its measures, is just only reproducing uh, the colonial origins. And th that is what we should be careful about. And this approach has to come within the international organizations, which um, we need to encounter um, within the global south. Mm. Thank you so much again, Tamir. We have a few more questions. They are fascinating, so I think we need to take the time we need to go through all these questions. I'm really happy to see such a global audience. We have all continents represented, really, so that's really encouraging. So next question from Ola BC. Dear Tamir, thanks for the presentation. Looking forward to your new book. I wonder if you have reflected on the multiple dimension of race and international law and how they manifest in the context of region which would um, which you alluded to in relation to Africans who are minorities in different countries how do you imagine these reproduction of racialized capitalism and livelihood this, this is very good for also for complicated ones um, so, uh, the multiple forms of race um, manifested in the global south um, indeed, I, 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 I'm, I'm going to consider that in the book as well, um, how these multiple forms of racism, uh, or sorry, of race um, are, are, uh, um, are evident uh, in uh, different parts of the world, in particular in Africa. Um, and it has to be linked also to the Otipositetis doctrine, uh, the, um, the ways how um, the marginalized communities are still not part of uh, decision making in post-coloniality. Um, indeed, a very complicated uh, question. Um, I, 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 the, the ways how multiple um, forms of race are still playing out uh, is, uh, if, if you think, if you, for example, think of, um, I mean, since BC asked this question, if you think of the Biafra people, I mean, um, it is it is some grievance that the Biafra people, for example, have within post-colonial state making that led to um, a number of uprisings. Um, if we um, look at uh, the the um, uh, racialized communities um, in, for example, uh, in India, um, race through caste, if you wish, um, th those are communities still cut off. Uh, a post-coloniality, uh, but we also have to consider, um, you know, uh, religious communities, religious minorities that are also, you know, uh, marginalized in those post-colonial uh, groups. Um, you know, to, to to give a proper answer to that is is very difficult. I um, I would I would I would say that uh, third world leaders. Uh, and have used the the forms of capitalism of post-colonial capitalism, new capitalism, as also Chris Maniapra uh, uh, explains in his in his great book. Um, he talks about racialized rule. Um, so um, he says that the racialized rule is a drive to impose the dominators order on the rebellious and unruly domain of colonized and so social and ecological life. This strife involves the ongoing and anxious compulsion uh, of colonizers to sequester, categorize, contain, arrange, commodify, and manage colonized people and communities. Uh, racialization allocates safety and quality of life to dominant and normed social groups by consigning selected groups of people to direct experiences of enhanced vulnerability to neglect, exploitation, social abuse, and premature death. Um, what he basically says to, uh, through the aspect of new colonialism is that in, at the end of um, the, the, col um, the, the rule of the former colonizer, we, it had replaced 
was replaced by um, a new colonizer within uh, third world countries, third world elites that have again used capitalism to racialize for their own power play, right? So uh, I think Nigeria is a very good example. Uh, Brazil is a good, very good example. And Sri Lanka, for example, is, a, is, a, is an excellent example. How capitalist drive had actually helped the third world leaders to manifest their power. And through their um, capitalist drive and neoliberal doctrines that were imposed also in, in engagement with um, the, the international institutions, we saw a further uh, fostering of uh, racialization. Again, uh, I will discuss it in my book. You know the multiforms, multi-way, multiple ways how um, race was manifested in the global south, um, and discuss it. But thank you very much for this question. I hope somehow I answered it, uh, BC. It's a very complicated one, but I will surely consider it. I think you responded very well, Tamil. Actually, and you stressed something really interesting in mentioning, you know, these sort of. Uh, shift from uh, colonialism to a new form of it within the third world countries, actually. Uh, yeah. Maybe that's the last question from, from Maggie. In this approach of searching for an international framework against racial capitalism, not uh, leading to the subtle racialized dynamics of capital capitalism in very different political, cultural, uh, and I've lost the question, <laughs> in very different political, cultural contexts, is it possible to have South-South localized effective frameworks against racialized capitalism instead? Uh... Can you can you just uh, you know catch on the last part of the question again? Sorry, I, I, it got caught off. Is it possible to have South-South localized effective frameworks against racialized capitalism instead of uh, the previous approach, which Maggie described as uh, searching for an international framework against racial capitalism, um, not leading in the subtle racialized dynamics of capital, capitalism in very different political cultural contexts. Okay, so ba basically, in, in a nutshell, a south-south approach, yeah. like a localized south-south approach to face racialized capitalism. Well, um, it could be, but I, I don't think it will solve the problem at all uh, because, um, I mean, how how are we going to you know encounter the the greater problem of racialized capitalism? Um, racialized capitalism, uh, you know, requires a global agenda, and a localized approach, like a autarkic approach, is not going to encounter and and de deconstruct the larger picture of racialized capitalism. Um, I understand where this question is coming from. Um, to to give it a, a genuine indigenous way of encountering racialized capitalism, uh, but at the same time, the global south is also very, you know, uh, is rooted in a heterogeneous um, fashion. Um, so I, I don't believe that it will help us to um, encounter this at a larger scale. Rather, we need an international engagement to um, not, not only localize but universalize the way of encountering um, racialized capitalism. Um, first of all, in encountering its history, that means co colonialism and racialized capitalism, uh, but furthermore, to create um, just measures within uh, the international organizations, but also empowering grassroots movements uh, in the global south that are um, taking the, the main brunt of um, racialized capitalism's profit. Uh, and we need to encounter this, um, the ways how we in the global south, I would say, and I include myself here in particular, are um, facing the downturn to racialized capitalism until today. So uh, it's, it rather needs the universal approach to rather than uh, the localized approach, mm -hmm. if it answers the question somehow. Right, and Maggie uh, is adding up something. Thank you for your answer. I'm coming at it from indigenous studies, as you realize. Interesting. Yeah, I mean, if, if I may add, um, just what, um, I don't want to drag this on and on and on. Um, I think the a very good description how we amplify the voices um, in this way to encounter 
uh, racialized capitalism comes from uh, the great uh, B.S. Chimney. Uh, Professor Chimney wrote um, a piece in the American Journal for International Law on the remodeling of customer international law as one part of the sources of international law, as you know, to give voices. And Maggie, you had this, uh, um, you know, coming from the indigenous perspective, he says that we need to amplify and create uh, something that is called com opinio juris communis, that we need to amplify the voices of the people on the ground, indigenous voices, traditions, cultures, this beauty and the splendor of those voices in the global south, those subaltern voices need to be encountered, need to be included in the making of customary international law to truly amplify the different voices and then also to encounter um, racialized capitalism uh, that is rooted and, and, and contaminating international law as it stands. So, um, and as a, as a side note, um, Professor Chimney is a Marxist, so probably has a very radical way how to see this. Mm. Yeah, fantastic response, Tamil, as well. And uh, I think we should have another webinar on what's exactly customary international, if, if ever such a thing exists, actually. But yeah, that was really great. I think everybody's really happy. I'd like to thank you, first of all, Tamil, for this great presentation and also thank thank everyone, because we had people from Australia, from Ecuador, from India, from a variety of countries in Africa and Europe. So fantastic. Uh, it's an open discussion, really. Tamil is yep. going to come Thanks up to everybody. a number of publications. I know many of us here are working, publishing on different aspects of the same problem. So it's great to have this sort of network. As I said at the beginning of the webinar, these webinars are recorded. You can find them on the website of the University of Portsmouth in about one week, I suppose, under the banner uh, Research Future. So in one week, you'll see Tamil again. So thank you so much. And I'd like to conclude in thanking the team to support me and in particular Olga. Thank you so much and see you Thanks next so week for another really interesting webinar on Iran and the role of media in Iran. Thanks so much, Damir. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you.